how to assess risk and figuring out what is the most dangerous thing on the board state. Hi and welcome to a podcast about threat assessment and flying under the radar. We're going to talk a lot about threat level. With me today we have William. Would you like to care and explain a little bit about what we mean with threat level? So whenever in CDH or in any magic format, when someone plays a card, you have to evaluate how much this card will affect the game. Some cards, like basic lands, will not have a large impact on the game, while other cards, such as Agnosium, will have a massive impact on the game and perhaps change the entire outcome. Cards that make more noise, like Agnosium, are considered high threat levels. But, and, and then cards of basic lands have a low threat level, they make very little noise, they're silent. However, what's interesting about this is that the threat level that generated by cards actually changes over the course of the game. A card like Agnostium will have a pretty constant threat level, it will always be very dangerous. But there are cards like, say, a turn 1 Llanowar Elf. That's a very good turn 1 play. However, a Llanowar Elf on turn 9 will have almost 0 to none threat level. There's a big debate about whether you should use a mental misstep on a Llanowar Elf turn 1. And I could actually say sometimes you could actually do it. But turn 9, I'm no. So it's, it's almost irrelevant on turn 9. Uh, turn 1, it is, it is very, very highly relevant. The, you have a mental misstep, and the person after you, they don't play something you can target, and the second player don't either, and then the third player plays a Llanowar Elf. I'd say countering that Llanowar Elves, knowing that you would have actually no turn 1 ramp from any one of your opponents, is a great play. So, but it will vary on the table, and we will deck your play. And that's really what's central to all this. It will vary. It will vary over the course of the game. In the first turns, you have ramp and setup cards that will generate that will be the cards that people generally play. They will either play cards that further their mana, or they'll play cards that will further their game plan, such as tutors or cards like Mr. Grimora. Uh, Mr. Grimora is a great example of a card that, if played early, generates an immense amount of threat. It, it is it is the highest of threat levels because you know that the person who plays Grimora will probably draw a ton of cards over the course of the game. Um, uh, Land War Elf might not be the most powerful turn one ramp card, but Carpet of Flowers probably is, depending yes. on the table. So yeah, so I, on turn one, Carpet of Flowers has a great high, like very high threat level, while it might not be as important on turn nine when there's only two islands in play, perhaps. The, the table is basically trying to figure out the threat level when three people have a, a spot removal and they're trying to figure out which of the pieces is the most dangerous card on the table. Exactly. The threat level is, like we mentioned earlier, the how much impact a card has. And this is something you have to value yourself. Cards don't just say on them how dangerous they are for you. Uh, as, as you will see in a little bit when we dive deeper into it, it also varies depending on not only where you are in the game, but also what you're playing. Moving away from the start of the game ramp and set of cards, uh, you will find that most decks deploy some sort of engine. Ursa tends to play Ursa themselves, which can is, is the deck's engine in and of itself. It generates mana and card advantage. But card decks like Thrasios decks, they tend to play Thrasios, having Thrasios as a value engine, right? There are multiple examples of this. Blood Pod uses stacks, Cast plays Cast herself or Spell Slings. Uh, there are tons of different ways that decks build their engines. And these can be either high threat or low threat but mostly all decks have some sort of threat generation. As you have multiple opponents though, you have to kind of pick which one you think has the highest threat. And this assessment is hard. It's something you probably heard uh, in casual games when people say, he's the target. It's so, yeah, it's so or, common or to hear that. he's targeting me. Yeah, yeah he's yeah. targeting uh, me. Why yeah. am I the target? <laughs> exactly, I'm not the target, right? Why are you attacking me? Yeah, he's, uh, and, and he's more dangerous than I am. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. And that's threat assessment. And in CDH, usually it's a little bit more black and white. You can look at Lana or Elf and say this is less threat than Carpet of Flowers. But what happens here is something very interesting. Different threat levels have different levels of noise. When someone plays Ad nauseum, it is of the highest noise. No one misses the screaming that is, <laughs> I put Ad nauseum on the stack. That screams out, it, threat! It you can say it how silently <laughs> I'm putting out nauseum on the yeah, stack. Exactly. It's not gonna go missed. <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah. No one's gonna not notice that. Everyone's gonna realize what's going on. And, like, you know, stuff like um, putting in a, a very iconic card also generates a lot of noise. Like uh, playing... Um, uh, Grand Abolisher. Food Chain. Like, food yeah, Chain. Yeah, Grand Abolisher also. Yeah. There's, Grand there's Abolisher these iconic is very, cards. Grand Abolisher and Silence are very high on the threat level. 
they are a little bit weird, yeah. but they are telling you you should start putting attention and dealing with this. I think that's actually a great example because if Grand Abolisher is played in turn on turn two, yeah, it is uh, actually not that big of a threat because if you don't have any other play, it's a great thing to play on turn two, and it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, so that doesn't actually scream. But if you play Grand Abolisher on turn eight. That is a massive threat. But, but I would like to say that Grand Abolisher should sit and scream noisy high threat level as the game goes on. It's something you have to kill. You can't pass to a player's <laughs> turn on turn five. Right, yeah, it yeah, goes yeah. louder and louder and louder. The, yes. the, the more likely it is that you can actually combo off, it goes louder and louder. But I, I know that you really like playing these silent threat levels. To try yes. to fly under the radar. I'd like you to talk about that. I'm, I'm very so interested. It's... There are different decks that are very noisy. And when, what we mean with noisy is that they are making a lot of threat and they are looking scary. While there are the commanders that are very silent, for example, Francius. Francius is just sitting there and drawing cards. That isn't scary compared to, let's say, Blood Pod that is putting Blood Moon into play and putting Hate Bears into play and attacking. That is scary, or people view it as scary. But, and it's kind of hard to actually see that the Frasius is also a really dangerous threat. You have to deal with Frasius because eventually those cards that are sitting silently invisible in his hand are going to do some really scary stuff. That's really interesting. Uh, can you, uh, can you uh, go into uh, your CC deck? Because I think your CC deck is uh, a really interesting example. Yeah, CC is... CC, the biggest downside in my opinion now that I think playing CC is that CC screams noise and threat. And I think CC is equally dangerous compared to, let's say, Frasius. But for some reason, because CC is just putting cards instantly into play, she becomes just that noisy and scary. She's doing things that you can see. Also, yeah. it is something you can't... You can, you can fear craft in your mind what CC is going to do, but sometimes you just don't have the energy to do that, so you just... Okay, I don't want to know what you can do. Just kill CC. Frasius can stay yeah. alive. It makes her louder, yeah. It makes her louder, and I think it's a big weakness to CC compared to, let's say, Frasius. They, they are actually they are equally strong and equally dangerous, but CC is making so much more noise. I think Kenrith is almost a better example because he... Um, in there, yeah, because he's also very he's silent, little, I'd say. He's, he's a little bit in between he, because... When yeah, Kenrith, between, Kenrith exactly. is drawing cards, that is a bit silence, but when he's like putting stuff from the graveyard continuously into play, people are starting to get annoyed by that and starting to see the mm. threat. Because you can calculate when people are putting reanimating things. Okay, you can reanimate a Nessa Hall from your graveyard. That is bad. Let's kill that. You're drawing cards. Yeah, that could be very bad, but it could also be very safe. Let's ignore that. So Kenrith is a little bit in yeah. the middle ground between CC and Francis, I would say. Yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, I think we, uh, we should remind of a, um, a, a kind of dynamic here, which is that the difference between noise level and threat level. Threat level is how dangerous something is. I would say that, uh, you know, CC activating and Thrasios drawing a card are maybe not exactly equal, but they're similar. Very but similar. But the threat level of one... Yeah, they're pretty similar, but the threat level of one is the, the the noise level of CC is so much higher yes. because it looks so much more dangerous, yes. um, and that will make Thrasios accidentally a better magic card in this situation. Yes, because he's somehow able to slip through and get ignored. <laughs> and now we're starting to touch a subject that exists in casual, going flying under the radar, uh, which shouldn't be a thing in CDH because everyone is equally dangerous. Just like you said, everyone is on the same threat level. But some stuff is just getting through and ignored and bypassed. I think the the exception to that rule, which is, you know, in CDH, yes, everyone should be on the same power level, but we're still playing 100 cards singleton. And that yes. means that sometimes people will draw more powerful cards. There are a few cards that mm. sticks out in power level. I'd say Mr. Gamora and Carper Flowers are two great examples. And sometimes you got them, and sometimes you don't. And if you do, your deck theoretically has a higher threat level that game. Yeah. This is actually st touching one of the problems with the CEDH format, that uh, if you look at the power level of all the cards, you're going to notice that some cards are really high on the power level while others are lower. Yeah. Everyone can agree that a carpet of the flowers is stronger than a land or elf. So it becomes a little bit of a luck factor, the ones that are drawing all their, let's say, carpet of flowers, uh, Mystic Remora, Odnos. Wow, you drew the best cards yeah. in the format. Another person is drawing their... <laughs> yeah. 
their uh, land or elf and their wild growth. That's not equal. Yeah. They are just going to be weaker. So there is, yeah. a, like you said, there's a target. Some people are just getting a better hand and a better game. And they should I think be the this is a conversation for yeah. <laughs> I think it's a conversation for greater minds than I. But um, overall, I think that if you want that gone, you would realize that CDH isn't CDH afterwards. Yeah, it's yeah. Sad, like I, I don't uh, like that because this oh, is a competitive player. Let's just mention but... something. I'm not against. <laughs> uh, I don't want to ban cards. Yeah, it, yeah. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm just. I'm just making a. Let, let, I'm just. That's kind of the solution, isn't yeah. it? It's like the, the solu- binding cards. The solution is banning these cards. Up, yeah. But it's the wrong we solution in, in my opinion. Okay. If we ban the like you say theoretically, we ban the top ten we, I don't think we should do any of this for the record. If we ban the top ten percent of cards, we will still have the same issues. Except that Solar Ring becomes the most powerful card instead of Mana Crypt. And if we ban Solar Ring, you know, you have the talismans, which are the most powerful. You know, it, it just keeps yeah. you know, there will always be more powerful cards than some. And you'll have your most powerful card and your least powerful cards in your hundred card deck. But uh, let's let's digress for a second because I want to talk about um, mm-hmm. I want to talk about threat assessment when or threat level when it comes to varying your opponents or varying what you're mm. playing. Let, let me let me bring up two cards for you: um, uh, Curse Totem on one hand <laughs> and Carp of Flowers on one other hand. If you compare these two cards, you will see that most people would think that Copper Flowers is a more powerful magic card. However, if you are playing Cissé, for example, and you actually rely on your activated ability, Cursed Totem is devastating. And yes. you would probably give your opponent 10 mana to remove it. Because it just ups your win percentage to not have Copper Flowers in play. Because you, you, you know, uh, you know um, Cursed Curse Totem them. in play. Because Cursed Totem, yeah, it rips you apart. And this is very interesting because this means that some cards will generate different amount of threat and noise for depending on what your opponents are playing. And also, yes. what the personal preference is. Right? I hate Remora. I hate Remora with my soul. It's my favorite magic card to play, but I hate playing against it, you know? I think your example is amazing because I think yeah. everyone has seen this happening. You're putting a, a hate piece into play, like Curse Totem, that is going to shut down, let's say, my Cissé, and it's a great play. You're dealing with me. Then suddenly, another person is counterspelling the Curse Totem because they are unable to win through the Curse Totem because they need their uh, activated creatures somehow. Let's say that they're playing Hermit Druid. But this is suddenly opening me up because even though, let's say, I'm higher on the threat level for the situation we've talked about that maybe I have all the broken stuff in play and I'm a really dangerous thing and Curse Totem will nullify me completely. But someone viewed Curse Totem higher on the threat level compared to me as a threat level. It's, I, I don't want to <laughs> say that that person is making a wrong play because obviously you can't win through the Cursed Totems. So you have to deal it in somehow. You, ha- you got to have a plan. Yeah, yeah. Uh, s- simply blindly removing the Cursed Totem might not be the play. You have to consider what you're doing because mm-hmm. everything that you do will have an impact on the game. Sometimes, it is adv- even if you also rely on extra abilities, uh, it's advantageous to keep that stack piece in the game because your win percentage is actually incredibly low if, you know, say, a, a very powerful CC player has access to yes. CC, right? Because Curse Totem is gone. And here I would like to say that yeah. the right decision is probably to let the player that is mostly hurt by the Curse Totem deal with it. For example, if I'm playing CC and I'm heavily reliant on getting my CC activation, I won't be able to win or do anything without it. I'm going to put all my energy into getting rid of that Curse Totem. That means that eventually the Curse Totem is going to disappear from my doing, so you don't actually need to do anything about it. Absolutely, uh, but it's very interesting because there's some nuisance here, right? Because mm-hmm. um, nuance. Because if this is a situation where you have access to a lot of mana, for example, it is very likely that you will untap one of your turns, remove Curse Totem, and then win the game. Yes. No, notice that there is no way for me to stop this. Uh, so this means that just letting you, like waiting for you to remove the Curse Totem, even though I also want it gone, will not be a winning play. You have to just take a second and use that imagination to figure out what happens if they remove Curse Totem. Are they going to mm-hmm. win that turn? If I Can I make a scenario where I remove Curse Totem and then win the same turn? How likely is it that I can actually pull that off? I, I know it's, what you mean. A, and I, I think the answer yeah. here is that you, you plan for two things. You plan to deal mm-hmm. with the person that is trying to remove the Curse Totem and interacting with them once Curse Totem is gone, either by winning yourself in response to whatever, depending on your <laughs> yeah. your play, of course. I mean, there are yeah. creature Depends activations that can win in instant speed, or 
you are suddenly able to destroy Cursed Totem in that opponent's end step and then win during your turn. This is also very risky because that will suddenly open up another player. So this is something you really have to <laughs> plan and strategize to a some great of, lengths. Yeah, a, a, lot of, a lot of pretty complicated game theory comes into here. And what it basically comes down to is have a plan. Know what you're yeah. doing. Know what you're, the, the, decision you're, the decision you're making. What does that imply for the game overall game? Because how is it going to affect your win percentage? How is it going to affect your game plan? Yeah. Uh, how is it going to affect their game plan? Uh, because not thinking about these things and blindly letting it be in play or blindly removing it could be a failure to assess the threat. Yes, yes. And this is difficult. I, I, this is hard. We are not angry at people who are making this mistake because in a normal 1v1, you obviously deal with the cursed totem immediately. But in multiplayer, yeah. maybe you should wait. Or it, maybe you should do it yeah. immediately. It kind of depends, but in most cases, you should wait. All we're asking is to think about it. And that's what we're doing too, mm. right? It's, I don't do this perfectly at all. Uh, no. I, I make these mistakes all the time. But uh, I, I, I do I, my best. But I try to I, think about what I also my make these do. mistakes. Yeah, yeah, of course. But everyone makes mistakes. CDH, I think, is the most complicated Magic the Gathering format there is yes. available. And this is one of the reasons. Um, interaction and how different decks interact with that interaction uh, is, is vital and it's incredibly complex and you don't yeah. even know their deck list you can only speculate what their deck list is so um most of the time but you also need to like think about how high is that card actually on the threat level for you for example if someone is cost putting a let's say a cursed let's keep on the cursed totem here and you can't activate your commander uh, your commander could be anything are you still able to do Kendrick. something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's say, let's say you're playing Kenrith, yeah. and there's a Cursed Totem in play, and are you actually still able to play the game? Do you have a Sylvan Library? If you do, maybe you could ignore the Cursed Totem. Maybe you think that the Cursed Totem is a really high threat level for you, but actually you could be kind of fine. Yeah, um, as you know, you're simply being able to generate card advantage or putting pressure through combat are two ways that you could just simply ignore a piece of mm. interaction that seems completely devastating to you. But if you really think about it, it's it's not. And here here's the, the where you once again fall to the central fallacy of all of this, which is noise. Right? Yes. Something yes, makes yes, a yes, lot yes, of yes, noise yes, doesn't yes. mean it's a threat, and something being silent doesn't mean it's not a threat the noise level and the threat level are different. And you mm -hmm. have to realize, what am I seeing right now? Do I see high noise or high threat? Or is it both? Or is are both low? It, it, it really depends on the situation. And But this is something you have to think about. I think the most things, like the, the biggest thing that people complain about in CDH, when it comes to, like through all of my, I've been casual, I've been competitive, through all of it. It's like this. Oh, why did you attack to destroy that enchantment? You were supposed to destroy that enchantment, right? Yes. Oh, you focused the wrong thing. You don't have threat assessment, oh, right? This yeah. is the problem because people fall for noise. And most of importantly, people disagree about threat and noise because they have cards they think are more powerful. I would like to yeah. mention here that the, the person who is claiming that you misplayed and you should have destroyed a Cursed Totem instead of Rest in Peace might be wrong also because maybe that person like we're playing different we're playing the same game yeah. but we're playing different decks and we're playing different commanders and different things are affecting us differently so every game is unique uh, you shouldn't be angry Absolutely. at someone for uh, destroying <laughs> what you consider to be the wrong thing take a step backwards and think about the person who's complaining right now are they biased is it possible mm. they're playing reanimator <laughs> right yeah. to this rest in peace so, you know, and, and that's it's natural. People get frustrated. This is very frustrating to see someone make this mistake, but this mistake isn't always a mistake. It could mm -hmm. just be a, a, a differenting, uh, like having different mindsets, of, you know, different approaches to the situation. Um, yeah. It could be something, I, like I tried to mention earlier, it could be as simple as that I have a ton of respect for Mr. Grimora. And if I see mm -hmm. it, I will remove it. And I will prioritize that over removing your... Um, uh, over and more like your vital stacks piece like if i'm really disrupted by curse totem but there's a remora and i can destroy one i would probably destroy remora because i can play the game and maybe draw into a removal for the curse totem but once you've drawn 10 cards remora my game is over yeah i, I can't I, let I, you have the remora so i will prioritize even though curse totem gives my you know puts my win condition the win percentage to zero for the time being so it, it, it varies a lot and this is a very, what you're actually talking about now is very complicated because you're thinking the next step. You're thinking like, okay, Cursed Totem is really dangerous, but this is actually even more dangerous and I should pay more attention to this. Even if I solve this, 
this is gonna blow up in my face, so I need to solve this first, and then I can solve the cursed totem. It's it's really complicated, but sometimes you just, you just gotta take things slow. I hope you enjoyed this little video, uh, this little podcast. We've been talking a lot about different uh, threats, how you should think, and a lot of our personal opinion and um, uh, play styles. But also, I think the answer is a lot about the play group, uh, how the play group actually views different things. And uh, you need to think about your opponents. Uh, you play your cards, but you also play the players. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video. If you like what I do and you want to support me, feel free to share my videos or even checking out my Patreon page. Also, purchasing cards from the TCG Players website using the affiliate link in the description below of the video will also help the channel grow. So a big thank you to all of you.